All right. So while you are thinking, make sure you're on Nearpod, VBCRT. As promised from yesterday, Mr. Tout and I are going to uh, partner up today so that uh, I can show some visual aids. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. All right. So yesterday, some of you may not have been on, on the Zoom yesterday. The videos are always posted to uh, Google Classroom. Um, but we started talking about what malnutrition was um, and that MEDCs generally have cheap, accessible food year-round. Uh, there's no real season for anything, even though in nature there are seasons for vegetables and fruits. Um, and that there's a lot of political influence that changes how MEDCs behave. Um, and in LEDCs, people generally struggle to feed themselves um, and that there are lots of limitations that come from lots of different places, uh, including politics, economics, and the environment. Um, and this bottom line here probably is the most important that uh, MEDCs use LEDCs uh, to create um, cheap crops so that they can be uh, sold um, for a profit by MEDCs. Whether or not you agree with that can be an interesting point of discussion. Um, I'm gonna make this a little bigger for everybody here. So there are lots of factors that determine what we grow and eat. Um, the big four here are climate, right? Because you can't grow bananas in the Arctic or, or, or really anything in the Arctic, but you can't really grow bananas in Canada, uh, but you can grow a lot of wheat in Canada. Um, and it doesn't make sense to try to grow wheat in um, Brazil where you can grow lots of other tropical things. Um, so climate has that uh, impact. Um, there's also culture and religion. Um, Religion defines a lot of what we eat. Um, our culture also defines a lot, a lot of what we eat. Uh, in America, we like our fast food, um, and so that defines a lot of the crops that we grow. Corn is in most everything that you would consume in a fast food restaurant, including the meat. Um, there are political factors. So the, the politics of, fee, of having uh, farmers being given a lot of money um, and which farmers get given a lot of money is a big piece of what is uh, called the farm bill every year. Um, then there are socioeconomic factors. So um, if you don't have access because you don't have the, the money to be able to purchase uh, more nutritious foods, then that is going to impact what you eat and what is grown. Um, and so there's an interesting infographic about dairy uh, and about the recommendations around dairy. Uh, the, the dairy industry pays $7 million to, uh, to lobbyists to try to convince politicians that they should act and behave in a certain way. Um, and so the government recommends three servings of dairy. Meanwhile, a lot of nutritionists recommend not eating dairy at all. So that's part of that uh, political piece of things. And that's on lactose intolerance. And, and while that's a great point, and while we are answering this, uh, what factors determine what you eat? Go ahead and put something on there real quick, and we can talk about lactose intolerance um, while you're doing that. So lactose intolerance is, is funny. It, people think of it as like a disease or something that's abnormal, uh, but we're mammals and we only require breast milk for the first couple years of our lives yep. at most. Um, and after that, your bi our bodies naturally stop producing the enzymes, lactase, to break down lactose. Um, but if you keep drinking milk, mammal milk, 
then you will, most people continue producing that, that enzyme because the body's like, well, we're still getting breastfed, so maybe we should continue producing this enzyme. You're tricking your body into thinking that you're continually getting breastfed. Um, pretty much when you stop, and, and some people, that, that enzyme just stops being produced, like it should naturally happen. Uh, when you stop, that's when you start being, quote unquote, lactose intolerant. Um, and it is a normal condition rather than being an abnormal condition. Uh, and so it gets spun into being something negative. And then there's, of course, medications that help you be lactose tolerant, which, which is kind of crazy. Um, so don't think of it as an abnormal condition. Think of it as the norm. We shouldn't be breastfeeding well into our 30s, 40s, 50s, and later. You guys, don't overthink this question. I, I mean, when I wrote this question, I was literally just curious. I guess I should have emphasized the you. So like what factors determine like what you eat? Like what are you having for lunch or dinner today? How did that decision get made? You know, who made that decision? You know, what factors went into that decision? So uh, certainly um, culture, socio socioeconomic status, access, climate, all of those are, are correct answers to this question. But when I wrote it, I was actually more thinking on a personal level. I was, you know, hoping to hear just from you guys more about like what, you know, or even who decides what you're, what you're eating and what your household is eating, um, you know, today. Uh, on the, uh, the topic of, of uh, continuing to, or, or of eating non-human milk, of, of uh, drinking cow's milk and um, sheep's milk and goat's milk, things like that. Um, earliest evidence points to, we started doing that about 6,000 years ago. And currently we, our understanding of human evolution is we have been around as a species for around 200,000 years. So, you know, we're looking at what is that? 97% of our evolutionary history, we were not drinking milk beyond our own mother's milk for the first year or two of our life or, or a few years. Um, that, and that sounds pithy, but I like the uh, argument of why are you drinking cow's milk? Are you a baby cow? And why are you surprised that you are having health issues? Why are you surprised that you're getting so, you know, fat or you know, but that milk is made for a baby cow and baby cows have to get big really quickly and so it's packed with all sorts of sugars and other nutrients that are really designed not for you as a baby human or as an adult human uh and so there's it it, it sounds really simplistic but there's a lot of truth to it um and yeah we're we're really it's momentum of, of culture that keeps us doing it. Okay, so yeah, we could probably rant about that for a long time. Yeah, we could, yeah, exactly. Thank you, thank you for the contributions. And, and Mr. Todd was just telling me how he went and got milk this morning, or last night. To be uh, fair, uh, we drink, I have been drinking almond milk and oat milk for the last three or four years of my life. So. It was a transition. It took me a little bit of time to get used to it. Oh yeah, it definitely does. Uh, so then, and, and, and this is, is actually, uh, once, you, once you get past the crazy graph here, um, the idea of the fact that we produce plenty of food for the, in, for the entirety of humanity, um, that the problem about people who are malnourished or people who are starving is not a food production issue, it is a food distribution issue. So what does that mean? So there are almost 3,000 calories of food available for every human on Earth on a daily basis. What is the recommended daily caloric intake? What, what is the recommended amount of calories per human? 2,000. Yep. 2,000. There is more than that available for every human on Earth on a daily basis. Well above that, right? Why are people starving? Why is there famine? Why is there hunger? Why are people even malnourished? 
Yeah, one in seven are undernourished. So, and, and so we see in this graph, right, uh, that Malthus was saying, well, you know, as uh, you know, we can only increase food resources so much, uh, Bosarub was saying, yeah, we can, every time we need to bump up food resources, we'll develop a new technology. Uh, we've discussed this before. And we seem to be in, in this curve, just to kind of shortcut this discussion, right? Um, but the, we seem to be in the Bosarub curve here because we're producing plenty of food. So, so the problem, I, I agree with you, Lena, uh, the problem is not a food production problem. The problem is a food distribution problem. So here we see where the politics play into this, right? Um, and climate also very much plays into this, especially climate change. Uh, this is the share of the population that is undernourished. As you might guess, uh, the reds mean bad and the greens mean good. So these reds, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, means that uh, a large percentage of the population is undernourished. Southeast Asia, same thing, a large uh, percentage of the population is undernourished, um, as well as non-Brazilian uh, or Spanish-speaking South America um, is largely undernourished. Uh, so, and, and pay attention to that question that Mr. Tout threw in the uh, threw in the chat. For those of you watching the video later, he said, "Quick review question: What's it called when someone believes we can fix environmental issues with technology?" Um, and and so what we see is this disparity. Um, this is often called the the countries that are shaded in right here, um, including Brazil. Uh, are often called the global south. Um, and that does not mean south of the equator, it means generally the southern countries that um, have all sorts of problems with food security, have problems with uh, the effects of climate change, including sea level rise, including desertification, um, and just generally food security. Um, it, it is really what it comes down to. Uh, it excludes Australia. The Global South does not include, exclude, include Australia. So we can often talk about the Global South being um, this one block of countries that has a lot of very similar issues that it has to deal with. Um, and it's no more obvious than in this graph. Um, now, what, may, what really drives this point home of it's not a food production issue, it's a food distribution issue. How do we get food to the people who need it? Uh, is this graph right here, or is this, this visualization of where the most food insecurity is within the United States? Now we just saw that what was uh, highlighted was like 20% or above. Well, in the United States, we have states that are well above 20% food insecurity. And those are largely in the Southern United States. And this region, the Southeastern United States is where a significant portion of our food production actually happens outside of California. And California itself, itself has almost 20% food insecurity. Uh, California is responsible for about 60% of the produce that's in our markets. Um, but outside of that is the Southeastern United States being a significant portion of agriculture. So they're producing plenty of food, they're producing plenty of food, but clearly it is not being distributed appropriately. So again, it's not a food production issue, it's not a calorie production issue, it's a food distribution issue. So go ahead, uh, answer this real quick about what should be done with excess food making sure that corruption doesn't happen, what happens to local farmers or markets. Try to just answer one of those per post. You can put multiple posts on, and that way, just like one quick sentence, one quick thought per post.
All right, awesome answers here. So excess food should be given to those who need it. Um, whoever produces the crops should manage the distribution. Now that's really controversial. Um, there are a lot of people who would disagree with you there because they would say that um, the farmers uh, should be the ones who are experts at production, but not distribution. Uh, whereas there are other people who can be experts at distribution, but I, I think that it, it's a really interesting point. Um, yes, so I'm going to share something really quickly about why the government should pay for redistributing food that is unused. Uh, food distribution centers, they, they are set up in a lot of cases, right? Um, and, and that's a uh, that's a really interesting point about not allowing for food that is that would otherwise go to waste to be going to food distribution centers or soup kitchens. Um, local farmers receiving a percentage of what they grow as part of their pay. Um, and that is something that will be addressed in the in the documentary that we're going to watch between Friday and Monday. Um, federally funded, funded farm share programs. Wonderful. Um, that is something that, um, again, is pretty controversial, but I think uh, could be done a lot more. So um, this is happening in real time. Uh, this is from a day ago, is that we've got farmers destroying their own crops um, because there's problems distributing it uh, to people who will actually take it. And so this farmer is plowing under their eggplant crop um, because they, they, they can't afford to fertilize it, they can't afford to water it, uh, it's just gonna go to waste. Um, there's uh, thousands and thousands of gallons of milk that is being poured down drains um, because it can't be sold. There's no one to sell it to right now and the federal government is not doing the job of redistributing. Um, strawberries going unpicked because uh, we're clamping down on immigration and uh, most uh, strawberry operations depend on immigrants. Um, and I mean, this, the article obviously has a lot of details about this, but we are currently going through a food distribution crisis. So um, we, are, we are really cruising through this section, but um, this is this is part four, uh, history of agriculture, and this is more than just um, agricultural animals. These are domesticated animals. This graphic, um, but when we talk about um, livestock farming, uh, we need to include that domestication first. Understanding how we first started um, harnessing nature, harnessing animals to help us out. Um, or to be able to eat them, right? And it turns out that livestock are really good at converting inedible things like grass into protein that we can consume. So this gives a, you know an overview of when certain animals uh, were domesticated by humans and where. Uh, does anything about this surprise you? Anything you know earlier or later than you thought? In a different place where you thought? Notice it does not say North America, except for the turkey. Nothing surprising here. I mean, I, for me, guys, the chicken is what really surprised me, like, Alpacas and llamas were domesticated well before the chicken. Like I thought chickens would have been back towards the beginning. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, we'll take your pulse again later. Uh, you've been doing a great job uh, on the collaboration boards. Uh, this is another way to look at our agriculture. Shout out to the Baxter Camel. Yeah, this is another way of looking at our agricultural evolution as humans, um, where 
where actual like agriculture as we know it, you know, only started a little over 10,000 years ago. Um, and depending on where you're talking about in the world, agriculture didn't actually start all that long ago. Um, not in a, not in the long view, right? So um, we haven't had this sedentary lifestyle, this, this lifestyle of, uh, as humans, of being in one place and setting down roots, literally and figuratively, and uh, cultivating the landscape. We haven't had that for a long time. So, um, you know, there's a lot of changes that we can make to agriculture uh, because we're, we're still figuring it out, okay? Um, so this is the part where I'm going to take off for a minute in order to uh, demonstrate a little bit, and Mr. Tout's going to take over. Mr. Tout, you're all set. Let me just double check. Looks like it. Um... Yep. Maybe. A little bit of a lag, so bear with me, uh, guys, as we're uh, going through these slides. But <clears throat> so as we uh, as we discuss, right, a very brief history of our of agriculture, right, which we've been doing as a society, and it's really defined our societies for the last several thousand years. Um, some key terms that you have to be familiar with: uh, sowing seed. And, and this is so sowing and harvesting are things that uh, if you grew up in a rural area or a farming community those are things you learned at three and four years old if you grow up in an urban community like we have you probably haven't grown a lot of plants yourself but sowing seeds is something you guys have done when we did the vinegar lab where we tried to see the effects of acid rain uh, sowing seeds literally just means to, to plant seeds uh, generally in arable soil that is fertile or, or good healthy soil um, and then, of course, harvesting, you probably have heard the term before, but just means collecting those things. Uh, scientifically speaking, means removal of the biomass. Um, monocultures and polycultures, I believe we addressed yesterday for at least a hot minute. Um, mono literally meaning one. I know you guys uh, mentioned that yesterday. Poly meaning more than one. And culture meaning to grow. So a monoculture means you're growing one crop, right? All the same species. So in this top picture, um, and it looks like in, in Mr. Dutton's, are these all the same crop, Mr. Dutton? So, all right. So yeah, let me explain what I got here. So um, this is actually not the same crop. This is an example of, did you talk about polyculture yet? I, I missed it. Uh, just, just that it would mean growing more than one thing. That's okay. what we're about. So this is, yeah, this is some polyculture. So um, here is a broccoli and, and you're going to have to just kind of look at my video. I know it's small, but um, make sure you've got like grid view open or something like that. Um, there's some cauliflower, you know, these are younglings um, and there's some cabbage. And the idea being that all of these are related. They're all in the same uh, crucifer family of plants. And so this whole plot w grows uh, relatively the same like family of crops, but this is still polyculture because these are different plants. All right. Um, and in general, the whole bed, all right, the whole raised bed is polyculture because we got a lot of different plants going on. Um, there was a frost that killed a bunch of seedlings over here. It's so sad, but we will replant the collard greens. All right. Um, but there is some sugar pea coming up. Look at that little baby sugar pea. Um, and then here are some uh, snap peas that are doing their thing. Um, and so this is, this is called square foot gardening and it's a form of subsistence farming uh, where you grow a certain density of plants within each square foot. That's what these um, that's what these strings are, is to mark off one square foot. Uh, so, you know, you could look at this and you could go, oh, that's monoculture. But if you zoom out then you see that there's actually a lot of polyculture going on in here. One other thing that I wanted to point out without stepping on all the plants. Um, one other thing that I wanted to point out was this plot right here. If you notice, the soil looks a little bit different. I'll try to show a good contrast here in the row that's closest to me um, versus the row behind and the reason is is that I'm growing carrots in this row right here 
So what I did is I mixed soil with sand because carrots like really sandy soil. Um, and we don't have any germination yet, just planted them over the weekend. And it takes a little while for carrots to, um, to actually germinate. But I do see a little green guy. I don't know if you can see him. I don't, I don't think my camera is zooming too well, but right in the middle there, I think I see a little germination of uh, a carrot seed going on. And so the, the hope is that because the sandy soil allows for more root penetration, that I will get uh, nice big carrots uh, because they will be able to spread out a lot easier than in the more clayey soil over here. All right. And so I'll chime back in when it gets to crop rotation, but just to kind of hammer home this point of polyculture. Oh, and lettuce. Yay. Yay, lettuce. So um, polycultures, right, uh, on a small scale are, are, are pretty easy to see and pretty easy to imagine. On the industrial scale, on the commercial scale, they are a little bit more involved, right? So when you have a farm, um, you can imagine if this whole picture, uh, where's my annotate bar? It's not coming up. Oh, well, not important. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse or not, but that's okay. Uh, um, so if you look at this picture at the bottom, the integrated polyculture farming model, um, if you imagine all of this is corn, uh, it will take fewer people and less um, uh, farming infrastructure. Uh, it, you only need one set of, of uh, farming equipment to only harvest corn. Whereas if you have a variety of different crops, uh, it becomes uh, more difficult, it requires more labor, it requires more equipment. Um, now, if you recall though, monocultures are significantly harder on the soil, and there are a lot of advantages to polycultures in terms of each one of these plants pulls a slightly different set of nutrients from the soil and has a different impact on the soil. And if you take the next step and each year you rotate which crop is where. In fact, if you also, if it's possible to rotate, I don't know if you guys can read that, but that says cattle. So this particular polyculture also has livestock. If you can rotate where the livestock lives, right, that is not a, that is not a cheap or easy undertaking, but there are benefits to your soil health and your soil sustainability if you rotate your crops. And I think with that, we're going back to Mr. Dutton. Yes, sir. So uh, over here, so in terms of crop rotation, um, this is a squash, all right? And so this squash is gonna be here this year, but I'm not gonna plant squash here next year because this soil is going to be sapped of the nutrients that, were, that would have been used to grow the squash. Uh, so I don't, I don't wanna plant right here next year, um, but there's something else that I'm doing in addition to crop rotation is that in between, uh, in between every row of squash, and these squash are not looking so happy because again, the frost uh, nabbed a lot of them. But in between, there's actually corn that we planted this weekend. So we're gonna have corn interlaced with the squash. And then we're also going to have over here, these are uh, tomato cages. And so we're gonna plant tomatoes in among some uh, basil and some peppers uh, and a couple other things like not help to alternate what's available for each, uh, each plant, but it also helps to protect from pests. So crop rotation serves two purposes. Um, the corn that I'm growing in these areas right here, uh, these are going to end up taking a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. But then the other plants like carrots that I've got going on over here and some of your crucifers, like I said, the broccoli and the cabbage and, and everything else, those are gonna help replace that nitrogen in the soil so that I could grow, for example, in this area next year, I could grow more nitrogen intense crops like a corn. Back over to you. Awesome. All right, so, is it gonna go? Wait for it. Did I skip a slide? Nope. Okay, so what we want you guys to do now is try your hand at some matching using some of the vocabulary that we've already got. So 
uh, some of the vocabulary we just covered. <coughs> so we're going to give you guys one minute. Go ahead and try the matching. on the Nearpod slide in front of you. Guys, definitely after your first attempt, I really like to I like the to see you guys are are making corrections, right? And fixing things as you go. That's that's the whole point of these slides is getting to think through what you think the terms mean, match them up, and then learn from those mistakes. The art of learning is all about learning from your mistakes. And that was a minute. I don't know if you're if you want to take back over, Mr. Dutton, or sure. All right. So, uh, Dade, let me give you uh, ten more seconds. See if you can finish that. I think I brought in a little fly. Wonderful. So, um, there are lots of different ways. So this is the last part. Okay. There are lots of different ways to actually farm. Um, and they're, we're going to split them into four just for the purposes of this discussion. Um, but what you are most familiar with is probably two of these, which would be the second one and the fourth one, cereal growing and horticulture dairying. Um, cereal growing is not like making Cheerios, all right? Cereal growing means making some sort of grain that you can use um, we're talking like wheat or corn, uh, that sort of thing. And um, an example would be in the Canadian prairies, but you could also talk about the prairies of the United States, uh, where a lot of wheat and corn is grown, including in Ohio. Um, and typically, this is extensive commercial type, all right? So we know commercial is for money. We know extensive is using a lot of technology and fertilizers and um, we know that, that you, you don't get um, a lot of outputs per hectare, but you do get a lot of outputs per farmer. All right, so that's something that you're familiar with, and you can compare that to something that's more subsistence agriculture, um, like in the Amazon rainforest, where you have uh, subsistence agriculture, where people are putting in um, all of that labor, that human labor, uh, but it's very efficient. So any sort of subsistence agriculture, like, like my garden, is really efficient. Um, I'm getting a lot of calories per square foot. Um, same thing with rice growing uh, in the Ganges Valley. And then if you talk about horticulture or dairying, uh, that would be something that happens a lot in Ohio, right? A lot of dairy farmers where they are producing milk and all sorts of milk products. Uh, there's a lot of um, grass that's required um, and that can have a high environmental impact because uh, it's a lot of fertilizer is required to keep that grass growing. Um, so we can consider farming's energy budget in two different ways. Uh, we can consider the total energy contained within the crop or we can calculate the efficiency of that 
of, of the farming itself. Um, and if we want to calculate the efficiency, which is arguably a better way to look at farming, um, we have to look at the energy contained in the food. It doesn't matter if we're using joules per gram, that's the metric or the standard measurement, which is calories. Um, and, or, I, well, both of them are, are typically metric. But we can also calculate the energy required to produce it, to produce that food and transport it. And we're looking at the ratio between these two things. If it requires a lot of energy to produce it and transport it, and you don't get a lot of energy out, then that ratio is going to be low. Ultimately, we want this ratio to be high. We want the energy that we're getting out of the food to be much higher than the energy required to produce it and transport it. So the higher the ratio, the better the food is as far as being efficient. Okay, so we look at this list over here and the best ratio is cereal growing. Okay, those, those high carbohydrate um, foods that we grow in the plain states, you know, the wheat and the corn, all that stuff, that's, that's super, super efficient. The least efficient thing on here is growing lettuce in a greenhouse. First of all, lettuce doesn't have a lot of caloric content at all. Secondly, greenhouse cultivation is typically really high input um, because you have to put everything into that greenhouse. All right, so it's very inefficient. Growing lettuce in a greenhouse is very inefficient. Chicken is very inefficient. You have to provide lots of input, lots of transportation. There's, there's lots that go into um, growing chickens, raising chickens. Um, so you can look at this and you can say, oh, well, grain-fed cattle is very efficient compared with a lot of these other things on the list. That's true. I'm not gonna argue that it's not efficient. However, there are some other impacts. So again, this is only one way to look at farming's energy budget. Um, Mr. Tout, do you wanna talk about this real quick? Excuse me. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm mentally going through all of the negative impacts of raising cattle as a monoculture, um, having seen them, like being been on a cattle farm, it's, it's overwhelming. Guys, settle down. Clementine, settle down. Sorry. Um, so uh, there are two competing narratives going on here, right? Uh, so one is the sort of idea that uh, cereal is the way to go, right? And the other is, what, so what are the benefits of, of focusing on livestock? Um, and certainly there are benefits, right? Um, so li the big one is livestock can... Uh, can eat and can grow and can turn into protein in areas where we might not be able to grow any plants for ourselves. Uh, certainly uh, very rocky, hilly terrain um, or uh, grasslands, right, uh, where we're not going to be able to eat the grass anyways, so we would have to uh, completely uh, turn over and change, um, change the ecosystem that's there to grow a different crop or to grow a different thing that's already growing. Whereas if you've got a grassland, you know, you can raise cattle there and you're just converting something that you can't eat into something that you can eat. Um, the other argument um, for being omnivorous would be um, proteins and, and livestock uh, and just animal products in general uh, are high in protein also uh, are very dense energy. So the energy that you get uh, is by volume a lot more energy. So therefore you can transport it more efficiently. So you know a truck, a truck, a, a transport vehicle that is carrying meat can carry a lot more calories uh, around, and therefore you use less fuel transporting it uh, because those those calories, the fats, um, uh, fats and proteins are much more dense. Um, calories than say if you have to transport a truck a truckload of wheat it's so uh, it's so much less dense that the wheat or the corn takes up a lot more space you can't fill the truck up you know more so you end up with fewer calories per truckload if you want to think about it in those terms 
And so then the other side, and this is why I, I was picking on uh, Mr. Talib, is because uh, he is uh, someone who, who eats meat. I am someone who doesn't. Uh, so then the other narrative would be that the herbivorous side of things, the vegetarian side of things, which is that um, you know, you're, you're talking about how much calories it takes to produce a thousand calories that we can eat. So in order to, so this is 36,000 calories of feed, all right? So we have to feed beef 36,000 calories in order to produce a thousand calories for humans, all right? That, that's a huge ratio uh, for, for cows, for beef. Uh, for pigs, for pork, requires 11,000 calories in order to produce a thousand human calories. Uh, poultry, it's 8.8 thousand eggs. So, so this would be the, the meat from uh, a bird, and this would be the eggs, all right, 6,000. And then milk, we're talking 6,000 uh, calories in order to produce 1,000 calories uh, consumed by humans. Um, so and, Mr. Dunn, uh, yeah. can, I, can I just ask, uh, in terms of my thinking about these, and I want to make sure I'm correct, but if you, if you want to think about them as, uh, so this is thousands of calories, so that's not actually a serving, but in my head, I kind of imagine it like, so if it's 36 times, right, the amount of calories, if we turn that into a serving, is it, my understanding of this graph is that one serving of beef took 36 servings of grain to make that beef be in front of me? Or more starkly, uh, for the amount of food that you had to give to the cow in order to produce the food that's on your plate, you could have 36 meals. Okay. That's, yeah, that's my interpretation of it as well. I just wanted to make sure that the way I was thinking of it was correct. Thank you. Mr. Tout is worth, wait, so, so Mr. Tout is an omnivore, so he would be worth like, like, I would say 80 Mr. Duttons. Sorry, I'm drawing, I'm making a graph here and I, I've drawn you guys. From, from caloric consumption all along the food chain, all along the supply chain to get the food to him, yes, there were, there, he requires more calories to be produced on earth than I do because I'm eating lower on the food chain, he's eating higher on the food chain. Yeah, so when I eat a burger, I'm effectively eating 36 meals that he, that Mr. Dutton could have in terms of grains. Cool. You guys are like little cartoons, that's why I'm asking. It's I'm very excited for this diagram. All right. Uh, so, so then um, we, we can also look at uh, farming practices in different places, uh, especially when you talk about subsistence or, or uh, human labor versus using a lot of technology and using a lot of machine labor to produce things. Um, and so this graphic here is describing the difference of farming rice in Borneo versus California, uh, okay. and how much energy, how much more energy efficient it is to do in Borneo than in California because of the difference in human labor and the difference in technology uh, and all these other inputs that are being put in. Go ahead, Mr. Tao. I just wanted to say, so for those of you guys who, who have your book around while you're sitting through the lectures, which I always recommend, um, this is actually straight off of page 257. Um, I like to make graphs and tables myself, but this one I was just like, uh, it's too much. <laughs> so I literally just took a picture of the, ta of the table uh, um, from page 257. So if you're following along in the book, we're right there. And so real quick, uh, there's a big difference between how we farm things uh, in aquatic ecosystems, so fish farming, uh, versus terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, so in terrestrial ecosystems, we typically harvest at the first and second trophic level, uh, meaning that we harvest a lot of um, plants, and we also harvest a lot of, or we, we pull a lot of the things that eat the plants, the herbivores, all right? We, very rarely get primary carnivores or top carnivores. However, in the aquatic food systems, uh, it's kind of an, an, an inverted pyramid as far as what we farm, what we eat. We eat a lot of the top level consumers 
in an aquatic food web. Um, because the lower level producers and the lower level consumers are too small for us to really consume. So we, we tend to um, farm from the top of the food chain, which has, as you might expect, a lot of devastating effects on that food chain. Um, so aquatic aquaculture or harvesting in aquatic food chains um, can be really devastating if not done properly. We're gonna skip the video, we really don't have the time. Yeah. Um, but th this is the last part that we're really going to talk about because it's possibly the most important and that it has to do with sustainability. So how do we increase the sustainability of our food supplies? Um, so soil can be non-renewable because of how we treat it. Um, it can be renewable depending on a lot of things, but one thing that makes it non-renewable is soil erosion. Um, and soil erosion happens when you have a lack of root structure. When you pull up trees and you try to plant annual plants like corn and wheat uh, and all your vegetables, then what you do is you destroy the, uh, the root structure that's in the soil that's holding the soil together. And after a while, that leads to a lot of soil erosion. Um, you also get a lot of salinization, a lot of salt that ends up uh, being stored in the soil because the more watering you do, the more salt you're introducing to, to the land because water just naturally has some salt in it. So the more irrigation you're doing, you're just salinizing your salt. Um, desertification is a result of climate change um, and it's a result of these other two things. Uh, the, lack, the lack of plants results in uh, higher desertification and as you might be able to tell, desertification is generally a bad thing. Urbanization, this is uh, actually an overhead aerial view of Cleveland. Um, but the more urbanizing there is, the more urbanization there is, uh, the lack of renewability of that soil, all right? The lack of sustainability. So there are things that we can do to improve sustainability. One of them um, is to reduce our food waste. Um, we can also change our attitudes towards our diet, eating less meat, improving education like we're trying to do right now. Uh, consuming insects, believe it or not, a lot of people eat crickets. Um, there's more and more of a market for that. Um, and reducing the processing and transport aspect, as you can see, I'm going through very quickly. Um, but here are the predictions for our food supplies as our population increases to above 8 billion people. Um, we are going to have um, fewer undernourished people, but the largest percentage will still remain in Sub-Saharan Africa. Meat consumption continuing to rise. More cereal will need to be produced. Um, we will have improved tech and irrigation, but we will also have more aquaculture, meaning more fish that is farmed. Any last word, Mr. Chow? Um, I have so many thoughts, but I don't want to go over time. So. Um, definitely feel free to go back and watch the video, guys. Um, can they can they follow the link by going back in the Nearpod? Like uh, the the link is shared on Classroom for the okay. student um, uh, for the student directed view, where they don't have to go back through. Okay.